In this video, we are going to talk about VLAN concepts. The topics we are going to talk about here are virtual broadcast domains or virtual LANs, VLANs, and we are going to talk about how to carry the traffic, the VLAN traffic, between switches. In other words, we are going to talk about trunks. And here we are going to talk about two different trunking methods using Cisco's proprietary ISL encapsulation and using the standards-based 802.1Q VLAN tagging. In one of the previous videos, I mentioned that virtual LANs, VLANs, create a virtual broadcast domain. Let me remind you about that a little bit. Imagine that you had an enterprise, a company, consisting of three departments. Let's say that you had an engineering department, that you had a marketing department, and that we had a sales department. In engineering, we had 20 workstations. In sales, we had nine workstations. And in marketing, we had three workstations. And the only thing that was available to us were eight port switches. How many switches would we need for engineering department? Well, we would need to have three switches. For marketing department, we would need to have two switches, even though one switch would be used with one port only. And in the sales department, we would need to have one switch here. So in total, to make this network work, we would need to have six switches for the total number of 32 physical ports that were in use. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that this is a terrible, terrible waste of physical resources. What if we added, uh, say, three more people or four more people into our engineering department? We would have to add a whole new switch. What if we removed one or two seats in our sales department, leaving just one workstation there? We would still need to have a physical switch available to accommodate for this number of workstations. This is why VLANs or the virtual LANs were designed. They're designed to solve this particular problem. You may recall here in the previous drawing on our whiteboard that I said that even though we used bridges or switches really because they are the same thing, they divided the collision domains. They haven't created multiple broadcast domains. If you want a real separation of traffic in a different broadcast domain so that the broadcast traffic from one uh, department is not seen in, in another department if you want to create some sort of uh, security policies uh, between these departments. You really want to segment this network into multiple broadcast domains. The only solution for that without the VLANs is to actually use multiple physical resources, multiple physical switches. But with VLANs what we can do is we can take one switch and divide it into multiple virtual broadcast domains. So here we would have a broadcast domain 1, a broadcast domain 2, a broadcast domain 3, a broadcast domain 4. So ultimately what VLANs are is just a way to segment a single switch into multiple broadcast domains. This is what switches do. As I said, now that we recapped that a little bit, let's expand on what we just learned. So, VLANs create multiple broadcast domains. Let's see that in action. I'm going to go to my terminal and I'm going to build a relatively simple network. Let me show you what network I'm going to build. I will have a single switch and this is going to be my CAT1 and to this switch I'm going to have three devices connected. This is going to be my R1, I'm going to have R2 here, and I'm going to have a PC running Wireshark connected to CAT1 as well. R1 is going to be connected to Fast Ethernet 01 on CAT1, R2 is going to be connected to Fast Ethernet 02, and PC is going to be connected to Fast Ethernet 03. I'm just quickly going to put in the ports that are going to be used on these devices so that we have a full reference here. Let's go to the terminal. So here I am on CAT1. This is the configuration of my ports. As you can see, I'm running all default configurations. So I haven't really 
touched anything on these ports, which means that these ports are now operating in VLAN number one. Let's confirm that. So I'm going to do show VLAN ID one, and I can see that all ports on my switch, including ports one, two, and three, are members of VLAN number one. So if I go to R1, which is configured just like this, an IP address, or R2, which is configured just like this, again, an IP address there, I should be able to ping between R1 and R2. Let's try that. And you can see here that pinging from R1 to R2 was successful. Let's bring in our Linux PC here. So here I am just confirming that I have an IP address on my Linux PC. From this PC, I should be able to ping R1, which I can see now. And also, I should be able to ping R2. This is all OK. This is what we expected to see, because all these hosts here are sharing the same broadcast domain. So they are on the same VLAN right now. This is VLAN number one. Now let's configure one of these ports to be in one other VLAN. For example, let's cut off our R2 here and configure this to be in VLAN two. In order to do that, the first thing that I should do is I should create VLAN number two. There are, generally speaking, in this particular case, two possible ways I can proceed. The simplest one would be to simply go to interface fastnet02 and say switch port access VLAN 2. Now you can see here that the moment I type switch port access VLAN 2, the VLAN 2 gets created. Another approach here would be instead of going to the interface to actually create the VLAN manually using the VLAN command. Now, I already created VLAN number two. Let's create VLAN number 20. So I'm just going to do VLAN 20 here. If I do show VLAN, I should be seeing my VLAN 20 created. But to my surprise, it's not there. This is something that can cause some issues if you are not used to this particular behavior. The reason for this behavior is really obscure one. Switches, most of Cisco switches, uh, use something called VLAN database to store the VLAN information. This VLAN database is a file that sits on the flash memory. Let me show you. So here I'm going to show you that I have a file called vlan.dat. This is by default the location where information about the VLANs is being held. When we create a VLAN, typing the VLAN and then the ID, um, this is not yet written to this file. The only time when iOS writes to this file is if I exit from this sub-configuration mode. I can exit either typing the exit command. Now, the file has now been written to. That means that VLAN 20 has just been created. Let's confirm that. So show VLAN ID 20 now shows me that VLAN 20 has been created. Another approach here, let's create VLAN 200, would be to simply go to another VLAN. But before I do that, let me just show you that VLAN 200 doesn't exist. I have VLANs 1, 2, and 20. And of course, I have a bunch of these default ones that are not, not in use on, on Catalyst switches for Ethernet switching. So now I have attempted to create VLAN 200, but it's not created. Instead of exiting into a... a configuration mode, we're using the exit command, I'm just going to create another VLAN, VLAN 201. This also causes switch to write to a file. So if I do show VLAN now, I'm going to see that VLANs 1, 2, 20 and 200 have been created, but VLAN 201 has not been created. Now I'm going to press Control C. This is going to take me all the way up to the privileged exec mode in iOS. This also causes the file to be written to. If I do show VLAN, now I'm going to see VLANs 1, 2, 20, 200, and 201 being created. Okay, so far so good. The current situation is, going back to what I said I'm going to do, and it is that I'm going to isolate R2 in VLAN 2 from 
R1 and RPC, I can see this in the output of show VLAN command. With show VLAN, I can see that VLAN 2, called VLAN 0002, is active on fast Ethernet 02. Which means that if I go to R1 now and I attempt to ping R2, this is not working. It doesn't work at all. Also, if I go to R2 and I try to ping from here, let's say I try to ping my Linux PC, that also doesn't work. But let's see what is happening on the packet level, on the frame level. On my PC, I'm running Wireshark. I'm going to start capturing the traffic from CAT1. And as we can immediately see, I'm going to start receiving the traffic that I don't really care about. Things like spanning tree, the keep lives. I'm also going to see CDP messages from the switch. So I'm quickly going to put in a display filter here. And I'm only interested in IP traffic. Also, I'm interested in ARP traffic. So I'm going to show only the packets that are captured that are either IP packets or ARP packets. Going back to my R1, I'm going to clear IP cache here. And now if I do show ARP, I shouldn't be seeing any entries in my ARP table other than the one for the local interface. So now I'm going to try to ping 192.168.1.2. I'm going to try to ping R2, which is now in a separate broadcast domain. This is obviously not going to work. I've already seen this before. But let's see what Wireshark has to say. So going to uh, Wireshark here, I see R1 asking the question, who out there has an IP 192.168.1.2? And we can see this question being repeated multiple times. But there are no responses. There are, of course, no responses because R1 and R2 cannot communicate. They are in separate broadcast domains. They cannot speak on layer 2 at all. What happens if I try to ping my Linux box from my R1? If I go back to R1 and I change this to 192.168.1.100, I'm obviously going to get some responses. I'm not going to get all the responses. I'm going to get four out of five. The reason why this first entry here timed out is, of course, because of the ARP. Let me show you that as well. So going back to my Wireshark, let's scroll this up a little bit. I can see here, immediately, before I started the ping, I see the question, who has 192.168.1.100? I get the response going from my Linux box to um, my R1, responding that 192.168.1.100 is at this MAC address here. And then I can see echo requests and echo replies going on. So I can see the ping. Now, what happens if from my Linux box I try to ping my R2? Or even better, let's try the other way around. From R2, I'm going to try to ping my Linux box. Before I do that, I'm going to restart the capture. So I stopped it now. I'm starting it again. And let's go to the terminal, and I'm going to go to R2. I'm going to ping. First of all, let's see the ARP table. If I do show ARP, now I see that I do have some entries there. These are the entries in the cache. You can see here, for example, that for R1, this is 66 minutes old. And for 100, my Linux box, this is 16 minutes old. Let's clear the ARP cache here. So I'm going to say clear ARP cache. And if I do show ARP, this doesn't always work. So let's try this. Clear ARP cache interface gigabit 00. And if I do show ARP cache now, show ARP, sorry. Now I have cleared my cache here. Let's try to ping our Linux box. So I'm sending the ping. When I tried this before from R1, none of these packets reached my Linux box. And I saw, um, sorry, when I tried this from R1, I saw the packets reaching the Linux box. I saw the, uh, uh, the ping going through, and I saw the ARP request. 
Let's see what is happening now on the Linux box. Absolutely nothing. Of course, the reason for that is this separation. These can no longer communicate on layer 2. This is equivalent of having these on two separate switches. We can say that we have one switch that operates in the broadcast domain, let's call it BD1, and here we have a broadcast domain that operates in another VLAN. So this is a separate broadcast domain, no relationship between these two, other than, they, other than the one that they sit in the same physical box. So here we have a port that is connected to R1, here we have the port that is connected to my Linux PC, and here I have a port that is connected to R2. But they cannot communicate here. There is a barrier between them. This is what VLANs do. They separate the traffic on layer 2 between different um, broadcast domains. They create multiple broadcast domains. Let's now move on and see what happens when we have more than one switch in play. So I'm going to expand our network just a little bit. So this is what I have now. I have CAT1 to which I have R1 connected, just like before. This is Fastnet01, this is Fastnet00 on R1. Then to my CAT1, I have my Linux PC with Wireshark connected. This is Fastnet03 here, and this is Ethernet2 on my Linux PC. Then I have CAT2. I have R2 as well, and you may remember that R2 is connected to CAT1. This is Gigabit00, and this is Fast Ethernet02. R2 is also connected to CAT2. This is Gigabit01, and this one here is Fast Ethernet02. My Linux PC is connected to CAT2 as well. This is Fast Ethernet03 here, and this is Ethernet3. I also have a connection between CAT1 and CAT2. This is FastNet024, and this here is FastNet0-24. Uh, this is the current configuration that I have on my devices. CAT1 has this configuration in FastNet01. You remember that we moved FastNet02, the connection to R2, to VLAN2. Fastnet 03 is in VLAN 1, and Fastnet 24 is now in VLAN 1 as well. CAT2 has the following configuration. As you can see, all three relevant ports on CAT2 are in VLAN 1, the default VLAN. R1's configuration has not changed in any way, and R2's configuration has not changed in any way. Linux PC has changed a little bit in such that I have actually removed an IP address from Ethernet 2 and I have not configured it on Ethernet 3. Linux PC in this particular scenario is just going to be a passive monitor. I'm not going to ping it or have it ping anything. So let's go back to uh, R1 and let's recap what is going on there. If from R1 I attempt to ping R2, this is failing, because R1 and R2 are no longer in the same broadcast domain. But, as you recall, the configuration, so this here, let's block it off. Actually, let me be a little bit more precise about that. This is in VLAN 2. But this port here is in VLAN 1, this port here is in VLAN 1, this port here is in VLAN 1, and this port here is in VLAN 1. This port here as well, and this port here as well. But I'm not going to focus on this connection, so let's imagine that this connection here does not exist. I'm going to do one extra configuration on CAT2. I'm going to take all the traffic 
from port 24 and I'm going to mirror it to my Wireshark using span or the switch port monitor. So let me go to my CAT2 here and configure that. I'm going to say monitor session 1 source interface fastnet 24. I'm interested only in the incoming traffic right now and I'm going to say monitor session 1 destination interface fastnet 03 and I'm going to say encapsulation replicate. Now what the encapsulation replicate does is in a case that I'm not using an access port uh, on my source, I'm going to use the same encapsulation, the same trunking method on my monitor port as I'm using on the source port, on the port that I'm monitoring. So let's see um, what my session looks like. This is what I have in place. Let's go to my Wireshark and let's start the monitor. I'm going to clear the filter that I configured and I'm going to start the capture now on CAT2. So I am seeing now some traffic being received on this port and I can see here, and this is what I was looking for, on the CD, in the CDP message I see that device ID is CAT1 port identifier fast internet 024. This tells me that my monitor is working. So now I'm going to put back my filter because I'm really interested in just IP traffic at the moment. So going back to my terminal and going to R2 now, I'm going to remove the IP address from this interface. And I'm going to move the same IP address to gigabit ether, ethernet 01. In other words, this is what I've done. An IP address is configured here on this interface. An IP address is configured on this interface. Let's see if I can ping across now. So I'm going to go back to R1 and I'm going to repeat this same ping that I had running here. And I can see now that it was actually successful. Let's go to our Wireshark and here I can see exact thing that I expected to see. I see the ICMP ping request. I see the uh, ARP response to um, uh, ARP response from R1 and here I see a bunch of ping requests. Remember that we are monitoring only the traffic going from R1 to R2. I'm not monitoring the return traffic. I, I, I'm not looking at the traffic from R2 to R1, just the traffic coming in from R1. Now what I want to direct your attention to is here in the details, I want you to take a look at the frame that we see. This here is just a regular Ethernet frame. I have the destination MAC address, I have the source MAC address, and I have the Ether type, which is 0800, which is IP traffic. For ARP here, Ether type will be different, it will be 0806, hexadecimal. But otherwise, this frame is just a normal frame. There is nothing special about it. Let's change the VLAN membership of ports to which R1 and R2 belong. So here, instead of having this all in VLAN 1, let's change these ports here from VLAN 1, let's change them to say VLAN number 10. So this is going to be VLAN number 10. Now mind you, FastEthernet24 here is going to remain in VLAN number 1. Let's see what happens now. So if I go back to my terminal and I go to CAT1, I'm going to say interface FastEthernet01, switch port access VLAN 10. And remember, this will create the VLAN unless the VLAN has already been created. I'm going to go to CAT2.
and I'm going to say, oh, I apologize about that. I'm going to say switch port access VLAN 10. Let's try to ping now. Now if I try to ping, this doesn't happen. What is happening in our Wireshark? Let's take a look at that. Am I getting any traffic? We can see here that the title says capturing. I am capturing the traffic, but am I getting anything in there? Well, I'm not, and I'm not supposed to be getting. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at the diagram. I'm going to create very quickly just a new one. So this is cat1. This is cat2. Here I have r1. Here I have r2. This here is VLAN 10. This here is VLAN 10. This here is in VLAN 1, and this here is in VLAN 1. When this frame arrives here, it is going to be sent on the back plane of the switch, and it's going to be sent out either to the destination port where the MAC address is mapped in the CAM table, or it's going to be flooded out of all ports in that same VLAN. Well, as it turns out, this port here is not in the same VLAN, which means that this packet here will never arrive to FASTIT 024, which means that it will never actually go across to CAT2. So how do I get the traffic in VLAN 10 across from CAT1 to CAT2? Well, there are two ways of doing that. One would be to change my FASTIT 024 to be an access port, and the other one would be to create it as a trunk. Now, why would I create it as a trunk? Now, imagine that I had some other hosts on CAT1 and CAT2. Let's say that I had a host number one here, and that I had host number two behind CAT2. And let's say that these were in VLAN 20 and 20 here. How would I get this traffic across and the traffic for R1 and R2 across? Well, the simplest solution, of course, would be to have an interface between CAT1 and CAT2. Let's say that this would be interface FASTNET 023. And put this one in VLAN 20. So this would be in VLAN 20. And have my existing FASTNET 24 instead of in VLAN 1, I would have it in VLAN 10 here. So I would have two interfaces for two VLANs. What if I had 500 VLANs? or five, yeah, I cannot have 5,000, but let's say I had 2,000 VLANs. How would I get this traffic across? Well, putting 2,000 interfaces between two switches doesn't really scale well from the perspective of ports and from the perspective of money on that matter. This is why VLAN trunks have been invented. VLAN trunks allow me to carry multiple VLANs across the same physical interface. How does that work? Well, as it turns out, there are two ways of doing it. There is Cisco proprietary way using uh, ISL or inter-switch link encapsulation, and there is also a standards-based using 802.1Q tagging. Let me show you that. Let's first talk about the ISL. ISL is a Cisco proprietary VLAN protocol. And the way it works is it encapsulates the entire frame. So let's recap what is happening with our frame as it travels through our network. Here I have R1, I have CAT1, I have CAT2, and I have R2. When R1 sends the frame, it's a native VLAN frame. That means it has destination MAC address, source MAC address, type length, it has payload, and finally we have the frame check sequence. So this here is our frame format. So this is the header here, this is data, and frame check sequence is just a CRC. So this here is data, this is the actual IP packet encapsulated in layer 2 frame. When this arrives on this port here, 
this frame is internally going to be marked with the VLAN. And in our case, this is going to be VLAN 10, and this is determined based on the port number where this frame arrived from. So when this goes on the backplane of the switch, and when it arrives to this interface here, we need to find a way to actually preserve this marking, to send this frame out somehow marked with this VLAN. The way ISL works is it's going to take the original frame. So this here is the original frame, and it's going to encapsulate it in the following way. So we are going to add the ISL header, then here we are going to have the original frame encapsulated fully, and finally we are going to have a new frame check sequence. Now, what are going to be the contents of the ISL header? Well, there are going to be a couple of them. Some of them are relevant, some of them are irrelevant. When you are troubleshooting this in production environments, and if something is really, really terribly going wrong, and you're working with Cisco TAC on troubleshooting this, you would need to know all the frames, all, all, all these header bits and bytes, and what are the contents there. The important thing is, that somewhere inside this ISL header, and I'm going to show it to you in a, in a minute, we are going to have the VLAN identifier embedded. Now, let's configure our link here, our FastEthernet24, on both sides here to be the ISL trunk. It's very easily done. So I'm going to go here on CAT1. This is the current configuration of FastEthernet24. I'm going to go into this port, and I'm going to say switch port trunk encapsulation ISL and I'm going to say switch port mode trunk. This is now going to convert the interface from the AX port into a trunk on FastNet0, on, sorry, on CAT1. I'm going to repeat the exact same command on CAT2. So FastNet24, switch port trunk encapsulation ISL, switch port mode trunk. I can confirm that my port is operating as a trunk if I do show interface fastnet24 switch port. I can see here that my administrative mode is trunk, the operational mode is trunk. Also here I can see that my administrative trunk encapsulation is ISL, this is how I configured it, and that the actual operational mode is also ISL, this is how the interface actually works at the moment. So let's go ahead and uh, try to ping from R1 to R2. First, I'm going to take a look at the ARP table. I don't have any. Let's go to our uh, Wireshark here. I'm going to start the capture. Going to apply my view filter that I'm interested in only in IP or ARP packets. And going back to the terminal, I'm going to say ping 192.168.1. Dot two. Let's see if this now works. And I can see that it actually did work. Let's go back to Wireshark. So here now I can see the ARP request. This is coming in from R1. After the ARP request, we can see our five, one, two, three, four, actually, sorry, four pings. And the reason why we have four is, of course, that the first one timed out while ARP was working. So we see our four ICMP uh, echo requests. But let's take a look at the frame itself. So this is the frame as it looks on the wire. You can see here that before I see the Ethernet header, I can see the ISL header. Let's open it up and see what we have there. We have destination, and this is going to be always fixed. This is set to a special Cisco proprietary multicast destination. This is 40 bits long. I have the information about which type of media we are using. This is Ethernet, and it will always be Ethernet. You're never going to see anything else unless you're using token ring or FTDI switches. And if you do, uh, well, good luck with that. Here, we are going to have uh, the settings, the QoS markings on, uh, on layer 2. In our case, this is set as best effort or all zeros. We have the source, this is going to be the source MAC address of um, 
our sender. What is going to be uh, the length? These three values, dsap, ssap, and control, are always going to be set to these values. They're going to be aa, aa, and three, all hexadecimal. This is here uh, going to be, um, oh, I can't remember what this is. Uh, I believe it's a high bits of source address. And this is always going to have the, uh, the, the fixed value, if I remember well. But don't hold my word for it. And finally, this is what we care about. This is the important bit. This is our VLAN identifier. And we can see here that it says VLAN ID 0x000A. And A in hexadecimal is 10 decimal. So we can see here that this is VLAN number 10. Also, finally, we have the indicator here that this is not a BPDU packet, this is BPDU frame. This does not belong to spanning tree. This is actual traffic being sent. And finally, we have index zero. And after the ISL header, we have our original Ethernet frame. And as we, as we can see here, we have the destination MAC address, we have the source MAC address, we have type and the original frame check sequence. Now, I would like to show you one more thing that I kind of skipped over. You see here that we have the source MAC address. We can see here, just look at the last two digits, it's 88. Take a look at this source here, it's 85. Why are they different? Let me show you that on CAT2. This is FastEthernet03, the interface that is facing our monitoring station, our Linux PC. Take a look at this MAC address here. Again, it ends with 5A85. Going back to our Wireshark, we can see that this is the exact same value here. See, 5A85. Now, this is something that ISL does. When it sends a frame in the actual ISL header, it's going to replace the source MAC address of the original sender with the source MAC address of, with the MAC address of the port that is actually transmitting the ISL frame. In our case here, this should really be the fast Ethernet 024 of CAT1, but you know what? The monitoring isn't really perfect because the frame needed to be regenerated when it was sent to our Wireshark, we are not actually seeing the original, original header uh, that was sent from CAT1 to CAT2. The only way that we could capture the original header with this source address unchanged would be to actually put the hub between uh, CAT1 and CAT2. And I don't know about you, but I don't really like the hubs. So this is ISL. This is how it encapsulates the frame. This does add a considerable overhead to the original frame. So, and also being Cisco proprietary, the industry didn't quite like this solution. So they came up with their own called dot one Q. We are going to take a look at the one, uh, that one next. So let's take a look at 802.1Q. When R1 sends the frame, you remember, it's the frame that is native Ethernet frame. That means it has no markings. When this arrives to the switch, on the back plane of the switch, we somehow need to mark this frame as belonging to VLAN 10. When we want to send this across to CAT2, we need to preserve this marking somehow. We need to keep it. Unlike ISL, which encapsulates the entire frame, dot one q actually inserts a tag between the source MAC address and the type length value. So here, between these two values in the original header, we are going to squeeze in the new tag. Now, because this does change the field and the length of this uh, header, the original frame che check sequence can no longer be used. So dot one q needs to actually recalculate the frame check sequence. This is much more efficient uh, approach than the one used by ISL because the overhead is much smaller. So let me go ahead to my terminal and reconfigure my FastNet24 here to no longer be ISL 
but instead be dot one q trunk. So I'm going to go to interface fastener 24. I'm going to say switch port trunk encapsulation dot one q, and I'm going to do the same thing on cat two. So interface fastener 24 switch port trunk encapsulation dot one q. Now the interfaces are going to go down and then go up. Actually, just the line protocol is going to do that. And if I do show interface fast uh, 24 switch port, I should be seeing here that now my administrative trunking encapsulation, how the port is configured, is set to dot one q. The operational trunking encapsulation is also dot one q, which means that as far as cat one is concerned, this is dot one q port. Let's go to R1 and ping our uh, R2. But before I do that, let's start the Wireshark capture. So I'm going to go back to terminal and I'm going to run the ping. As we can see, all five pings were successful. Going back to my Wireshark, I can see here my five pings. But let me show you the frame here on the wire. First thing that I'm noticing in comparison to the ISL output that we had before is that I no longer have the ISL header that sits above the Ethernet. So the frame is not encapsulated. I have the Ethernet frame here. Let me open it up and show you something here. It wasn't only the, uh, uh, the insertion of the tag that happened. Take a look at the value here. This is the type of the upper layer protocol, or at least it's what it's supposed to be. Here my Wireshark telling me, is telling me that this is now 0x8100 or 8100 hex. This is not IP and this was IP packet. What this actually is, is something that .1q is, called, uh, is calling the tag protocol identifier. This tells the switch that it should handle this frame as if it was .1q frame, which it is. So here is my dot one q header. Here I can see first things first after the attack protocol identifier I can see that the priority is zero. Priority is uh, actually also known as the cost COS. This is the layer two uh, signaling for the quality of service. These bits are called the priority bits also defined in 802.1p standard. As we can see, they're all set to zeros, which is the default. Then I have something called canonical format indicator. The CFI tells me in which format the MAC address is. Is it canonical or non-canonical format? To be honest, I really don't know or don't care what that is. Finally, here we have the VLAN ID. And unlike ISL, this is now shown in decimal format. Here I can see that the VLAN ID is 10. Finally, I have the type. Now, this is the original type of the frame that was carried. If I go back to my, um, to my whiteboard, I can see here that I've shown you that the frame, that the, the tag was actually inserted between the source address and the type length value. But you could have also said that it was inserted here with type length value being changed and then new type length value being inserted here. But that's really more confusing than just saying that it is inserted here and that there is this tag protocol um, um, identifier TPID sitting uh, at the beginning of the tag and that we are simply preserving the original uh, type length value from the original Ethernet frame. So this is how trunks work, how ISL works and how dot one q works. But we are not really done with this stuff because on Cisco switches you can do a lot of interesting things with trunks. More about this in the next video.